One of my viewers, whose name is Chris, just contacted me the other day and uh, suggested I do a movie um, showing you uh, the story behind some of the models in my man cave. As many of you have no doubt noticed, um, you know, I've got various models and things in my man cave and they've featured in the background in some of my videos. And uh, I thought, well, okay, I'll show you some of these models and artifacts. And at the same time, it'll tell you a little bit about my background. And I'll try to shoot them in some kind of chronological order and get some kind of cohesive story to this, if I can do so. And I'll try to tie it into war games if I can. Okay, going way back in time now to 1959. I was only uh, eight years old. And a big event occurred in that year that uh, was to affect my life to a great degree. That was the launching of the submarine Nautilus and its subsequent navigation of the globe submerged and going under the North Pole. Now, being an eight-year-old, I certainly wasn't watching the news stories, but those clever people at Rice Krispies released this little wee baking powder model of the Nautilus. And what you did was you put some baking powder here in the little the bottom of the submarine, you put this little piton on it, shook the submarine, put it underwater, and it sank to the bottom of your bathtub or sink. That wet the baking powder, which caused a bubble. The submarine rose to the surface, tilted a bit, broke the bubble, and plunged back down into the depths. So for a nine-year-old, that was fascinating. So you can see the effect that would have on a nine-year-old. Fast forward now, 20, 30 years later, I caught the game Submarine by Battleline. It was later redone by Avalon Hill in an expanded edition. And today, of course, I still like the series here by Gregory Smith, those solitaire games on submarines. So, uh, yeah, toys you have when you're a kid affect you for the rest of your life. At least they did for me anyway. Okay, fast forwarding to about 1963. Now, I didn't see this movie when it came out, the PT-109. Of course, it's all about John F. Kennedy in World War II. He was the commander of PT-109. And in that campaign, the PT-109 was rammed by a Japanese destroyer and sank. And, um, well, of course, President, uh, he later became President, President Kennedy. Horrible assassination in 1963, November 22nd. My generation will always remember that day. We all can remember what we were doing that day. But I was too young in 63 um, to be following the big current events. And uh, But the Rice Krispies released this little model of the PT-109. Again, it was baking powder. You opened up the uh, vessel, put baking powder in it. The baking powder got wet and emitted little bubbles out of here and it propelled the ship forward. PT-109 is a movie I still see today. I've got it on DVD. And um, that little vessel and plus this little submarine uh, engendered a, a love of naval and uh, battleships and stuff uh, which lasted uh, for the rest of my life. Now in the man cave, some of you may have noticed the poster to Sink the Bismarck, another film that greatly affected me. Um, I had a love affair with the Bismarck after seeing this film. Wanted to get the model and all that stuff. And of course, later on, I did get a model of the Bismarck, but uh, that would be about 60, 61, I think. Sink the Bismarck, starring Kenneth Moore and Dana Winter. A terrific movie, black and white, done with very good model work. Not uh, with all the CGI you see today. Very good movie. Now, in 1961, the American centennial of the Civil War was going on. Now, being a resident of Canada, uh, we still got a lot of the uh, programs and advertisements and toys that percolated up from the States about the Civil War. And one night, my father came home. Uh, he was a grocer. And he came home with these bubblegum cards of the Civil War for me and my brother. We had a bunch of sets and it became a, a driving passion for me to get the entire set. 
There's 88 cards in the set and the imagery it had on the mind of a 10 year old was just amazing. Uh, I love the artwork in it. It wasn't politically correct by today's standards. They were kind of gory. And in chronological order, they told the story of the Civil War. The Angry Man, John Brown, President Joe Davis, Fort Sumter. No, it didn't quite happen like that. Rebel Power, the First Battle of Bull Run, Exploding Fury, Fort Henry Donaldson, and so on. There was 88 cards in the set and the imagery in these um, cards, I, I, I just can't overemphasize what they did. They just uh, engendered in me a love of the Civil War, which endures to this day. And of course, uh, a lot of you have seen my other videos uh, of all kinds of Civil War games. I think I've got 65 videos out there on the, on the Civil War. And I just noticed too in my Bismarck game there, and um, which is from 62, and I've got the 77 edition too. So my interest as a child certainly affected my interests as an adult. So those are the original and battered cards from 1960 and 61. And later in life, I was able to get a second set, mint condition, but this is a British edition. And apparently they're not as worth as much. I think they're slightly smaller, but they're in excellent condition. And I was always thinking of uh, giving this to a friend of mine who back in 60, 61, helped me complete the set because he had the one missing card that I needed to complete the set. So that's the story of how I got into the Civil War and uh, how I'm still interested in it today. As an aside, later on they came out with these pirate cards. I think there's 66 in the set and I do not have the whole set of these. They're going for collector prices and I have no hope of completing the set. A couple of duplicates there. They were kind of gory and not politically correct too. Who cares? And um, maps of the Caribbean, history of the pirate, that kind of thing. I mean, who doesn't like pirates? Anyway, that's another part of my collection. Now during that same time period, my parents took me to go see the movie Gone with the Wind. So I would have been about 10 or 11. And that's a three hour and 20 minute movie, more of a love story than a Civil War drama. And everybody sort of remembers the Civil War battle scenes and stuff like that. But I'm sorry to relate to people that there are no Civil War battle scenes in Gone with the Wind. We see Civil War soldiers, we see them marching, we see the, um, burning of Atlanta, but there are no battle scenes in Gone with the Wind. But to the mind of a 10 year old, 11 year old, its impressions uh, stayed with me forever. Of course, I have the movie on DVD and have seen it many, many times. Um, there you see a little wee, um, it's actually a birthday card of Gone with the Wind, which I got from my mother one year, and a couple of the painted soldiers, Revolution, Civil War, and of course, I had a, a love of the uh, Confederate Kepis and the Union Kepis. I've owned various caps, uh, Civil War of the Year. On the left, you see um, a little wee diorama my friend made of Stonewall Jackson. And another one here, uh, my friend Harry painted up for um, a, a Union or Confederate soldier. This is one of my poor painting efforts at a Revolutionary War soldier. And another toy I had from my childhood was these uh, um, World War I cannon. We used them to shoot mass matchsticks. You could put matchsticks in the barrel of a cannon, pull the lever back, and fire them out. So Gone with the Wind, another movie that uh, had a great effect on my life. You might have noticed in the background some of those models up there of uh, monsters. And uh, we'll take a closer look at them, and I'll tell you the story behind them. Now back in about 1959, 1960, I don't know, remember the exact year, there was a late night show called Shock Theater. And what they did was they showed the old library of Universal Monsters. And um, my mom let me stay up to see them. Uh, I don't know if my little brother watched them or not, I forget. Tommy was three years younger than me. And uh, I remember the first one was Frankenstein. 
then the next week was Dracula, and I think it was the Wolfman, then the Mummy, and so on. Eventually, they showed the Island of the Lost Souls and the Invisible Man. Just fell in love with those um, monsters. And later on, Aurora released these model kits, which you uh, had to make yourself and paint up. This is not the one from 1961. I no doubt broke mine as a kid somehow or shot it up with the air rifle, don't remember. Uh, this one I purchased, I think, in the 70s and it's full of dust and stuff, but uh, uh, I rate my painting as competent. I'm not a great painter. Later on I got lazy when this company uh, released this Invisible Man model fully painted. I said, oh, I gotta have him. Claude Rains to me just chew up the scenery in that movie. He just loved the Invisible Man. Strangely enough, Phantom of the Opera, which I bought the model for, uh, was not part of the Shock Theater series. Now that's Lon Chaney in Phantom of the Opera, which was a silent movie, and I guess that's why it didn't go over too well in Shock Theater. So I didn't see Phantom of the Opera till much, much later on late night television. I think the version of the Phantom of the Opera that I saw was the Herbert Lom version done in 62 by the British color movie and quite good in its own right. I think in the canon of monster models there was at least oh, 10 or 12 on the set and I had uh, a good bunch of them but these are the only ones to survive in my collection today. Now back in 1963 I was seeing a lot of movies on Saturdays with my friends. We often see uh, what we call today sword and sandal movies, but that uh, name wasn't used back then. We just called them uh, Roman movies, whether they were Roman or Carthaginians or Spartans. And one of my favorites was The Giant of Marathon. And of course, we all loved the actor Steve Reeves. He was kind of cool. Saw the Goliath and the Barbarians back then too, again Steve Reeves. There's good old Sink the Bismarck, again, still one of my favorites. And uh, we also saw The Son of Spartacus, starring Steve Reeves. And the one I'm going to talk about today, and has the connection with the man cave, is Jason and the Argonauts. This was a tremendous film, and I never forgot it. Jason and the Argonauts featured some terrific special effects by Ray Harryhausen. And one of the great special effects was this giant... Uh, iron bronze man called Talos. It was actually a statue. And uh, scale wise, uh, the man is about the size of Talos's toe or so. That's how big he was. And the special effects were tremendous. So when this model came out, I just had to buy it, already painted. And uh, there she sits on the top of my um, game cabinet. Now to the left of Talos you can see a uh, Roman catapult. We'll take a closer look at that. I think the technical name for these things are called Onegers, but uh, I don't recall seeing them in too many films. I remember they're filmed, or we see them in the miniseries Masada, which I thought was uh, another terrific film, or miniseries. Like most kids, I liked comic books, and I tended to buy the classics illustrated ones, always picking titles that were consistent with my interest. For example, this uh, 25 cent annual on the Civil War, I treasure, War Between the States, and uh, that's from the movie The Great Locomotive Chase. That's a great movie too, by the way, Disney film. Uh, I still have it today. Uh, Hercules Unchained was a big influence. Again, Steve Reeves, another great movie. The Iliad got me learning about the Greek gods and Greek history and stuff. And uh, one of my favorite com uh, comic books was Caesar's Conquests. Now, the funny thing about impressions that are left with you, I remember this one panel from the um, comic book where this Gallic slave throws a spear at the Roman fort to leave a message for Caesar. And uh, the message is only seen a few days later. It's, it's funny that 
One or two images from a comic book will remain with you for the rest of your life. Uh, the Raven, I was a great fan of the Edgar Allan Poe movies uh, done by Roger Corman, so I saw all of them. I have them on DVD today. The Raven, uh, Fall of the House of Usher, Pit in the Pendulum. I don't have any gaming interests that tie in there. The Invisible Man, we've already seen the model. The Time Machine, one of my absolute favorite movies of all time. The 1962, I think, Rod Steiger, or Rod Taylor version was very good. This one, War of the Worlds. This is a comic I read over and over and over again. I just love these Martian walking creatures. This was a fantastic story, a great comic. And later on, when um, a company released a model on it, I just had to have it. Now this is the one I had to build and paint myself, so again, I'm not the greatest painter. And I've got to fix the antenna on this fella here. There's a small antenna that sticks out. You can see the remains of the um, ship that the Martians came in. And uh, this particular one was faithful to the comic book, not necessarily to the, um, the original story. You can see the uh, ship there. And of course the model ship. War of the Worlds is a great story. They did a movie of it in the 50s with Gene Barry. It wasn't bad, but it uh, didn't feature the walking creatures. I guess the technology didn't allow for, for that. The new one with uh, Tom Cruise, I, I don't even acknowledge its existence. I can't stand that movie. But uh, I was very much into science fiction. Now in 1967, my sister was living in California, and she told me about this television show called The Invaders, about aliens coming down to Earth and invading and stuff. And I always hoped that it would come to Ottawa, and sure enough, it did. And when it did, I was just addicted to it. They did release a model kit on it, the Invaders spaceship. Um, I fell in love with the design. It just kind of looked kind of cool. Those are supposed to be the landing lights. And you can take the top off and you can see the aliens inside with the uh, regeneration chambers and stuff like that. Um, I just love the show and uh, I still watch it today. Fortunately, it's all released on DVD now, so I've got the whole Invaders two seasons. Still enjoy it today. I don't remember when the um, movie Midway was released, but I certainly liked that one a lot. And even the game Midway, which is one of my early games, I fell in love with that game too. That got me interested in the Pacific War, and I became obsessed with the battleship Yamato. I like to read everything about it, and the sister ship Masashi. Now, I'm not a great air enthusiast. Um, I never had a, much of a, an attraction to airplanes, but the Japanese Zero I did. There's just something about that plane that uh, I really liked. So I got this uh, model already done. That's not my painting. So my interest in the Pacific War extends to games like Empire of the Sun and Midway, of course. That um, campaign interests me very much. Getting back to science fiction, um, a movie that I wanted to see as a kid but never got to see was um, First Spaceship on Venus. My friends and I had seen little wee clips of the movie, like 10 minutes long, 8 millimeter clips, and uh, we always wondered what the movie was about. I finally have it on DVD. I do like it. It's very much a product of its time. But what I fell in love with was the, the ship, the Cosmostrata it was called. And I loved its elegant design with the three rockets, the central, central fuselage, you might say. and. Um, it, I don't know, it's just a cool design. Um, first Spaceship on Venus. If you get a chance to see it, uh, you might find it laughable today, but hey, what? I was 12, 13. It looked like quite a movie to me back then. Of course, I was a Star Trek fan, and like many kids my age too, I had my Enterprise models that I bought and painted and 
probably shot up with the air rifle and rebought them again. And I just don't think there's any better elegant design than the original USS Enterprise. It's a fantastic um, looking ship and uh, I'm a Star Trek fan even today. Okay, these are some of the uh, Valley Games Edition counters for the fantastic game uh, Hannibal by Avalon Hill. I think it's still a great game. I still play it, and I like the original edition still the best. They keep poking around with the map, and I don't know. I haven't really liked the newer editions. But my friend Harry painted these up, and he did an excellent job. I can't paint like that. But uh, when you put these guys on the board, it, uh, the game really comes alive. Hannibal is a really, really good game. And back in the 60s, they had a model of the uh, missile firing submarine Halibut, and it cost 19.95, which was a fortune in 1960. And I never did own the model. But by the time the 70s came around, uh, I was able to acquire a copy, and uh, it was a natural diving submarine. It went underwater and worked on about six batteries, I think it was. And unfortunately, in a foolish thing, I. Um, had the submarine go down to Lake St. Pierre where our cottage was and I lost it in a storm. It sunk and I've never recovered it. So later on I found on the web this model of the halibut, a different one. This is an entirely different size. This one is not a diving sub. But the halibut submarine, uh, I always like the features of it. It was a prototype. There was no other ones made like it. What happened was there was a missile underneath the deck here they'd uh, arrange the missile would come out, go up here, and then fire. So it was the first missile firing submarine. Again, it was not very practical. Another battleship that I just had an addiction for was the battleship Fuso and its sister ship. Just something about those pagoda masts of the Japanese battleships that just drew my attention. I love the look of them. And uh, it's in the campaign of Leyte Gulf and I don't know when it got sunk in the Pacific War, but uh, the battleship Fuso, another little model I have. And one of my favorite films of all time is 2001 A Space Odyssey. Now I saw this in 1968 when it premiered in Ottawa. I distinctly remember it was on a Saturday afternoon because it was the Saturday afternoon that the Great Cup was playing, or actually live in Ottawa which goes to show you my non-interest in sports. I have absolutely zero interest in sports, except for maybe car racing. But football, hockey, all that kind of crap just doesn't interest me. So there you have the poster 2001 as it was in 1968. A small red figure of um, the astronaut, Bowman. Below him is a very small model of the Discovery and in the upper left is the sequel poster, 2010. Of course, there's three or four books in the series, 2061, 3001, but they have not been made into movies. And over here, the other small rocket ship is a tribute to the movie Destination Moon, showing you a conventional rocket of the time. When I was in grade four, our teacher, Mrs. Pettigrew, took us to the Ottawa Art Gallery. And that's when I first saw Benjamin West's famous painting, The Death of Wolf, and I was captivated by it. I never forgot it. Now I have a reproduction of it today in the Man Cave. I always wanted to visit that location. I said to myself, someday I have to go to where that happened. I wanted to stand where that occurred. And it wasn't until the 70s, 77 I think, maybe 76, I went with a class, a museum technology class, to Quebec City. You can see the spires of Quebec City in the background. And I went to this exact spot. It's marked where Wolf fell. And uh, I never forgot Wolf's painting. Another movie I really enjoyed was the made-for-TV movie, The Odyssey, starring Armand Asante and Greta Saki. Very good movie, too. Up there, we've got a Roman Quincarim, 
I'm interested in ancient warfare and naval warfare, so that was a natural model to get. Another influential movie for me was Little Big Man, who was uh, an eyewitness to Custer's Last Stand, and of course that translates to my um, Indian Wars games, Plains Indian Wars, and uh, Rosebud, Dobie Walls, and of course Little Bighorn. Another one of my interests is Spaghetti Westerns. This is the Italian poster for Once Upon a Time in the West. I've got a lot of Spaghetti Westerns, I think maybe 50 or 60 on DVD, and of course all of the Sergio Leone films. Over here we've got uh, General John Burgoyne, He's one of my favorite characters in the American Revolution. And um, of course he's the uh, general who was defeated at Saratoga. Here's a view from my man cave window through the screen. It's a rainy day here in Ottawa. And that's our new transit way being built. It'll be finished in about two years. So we'll close up the little tour of the man cave. Um, these are all my magazine games. They're all hidden away. You know, I'm pretty hard on the magazine games and just various war game paraphernalia. And I think I showed in my other videos, I have a little map of uh, Canada and the United States with little pins showing you all the places I visited. And this little cat clock, which I usually don't have going because it's kind of noisy when I'm doing videos, but. I've had that for a few years too. So anyway, I hope this didn't bore you to death. That's the man cave and some of the objects in it. Thank you for watching.